Parity Picks is a new initiative for us here in 2021. We're combining two of our values, fun and growth, and showcasing careers differently. Over the next year, we're gonna be showcasing 10 executive careers while doing something that we love. First up is Lorraine Thomas, the Chief Product and Innovation Officer from HCF, one of Australia's leading health funds. In this office, we call Lorraine the humble achiever. Lorraine has, over the last five years at HCF, taken on quite a few different departments. Her role has increased and broadened while managing a very young family and still maintains to be an incredible wife, daughter, friend and colleague. When I offered Lorraine the role as product head five years ago, there was a time that she wasn't going to take the role. And the reason was that she was in early stages of pregnancy and she wasn't sure if it was the right move for HCF to hire her or for her with her growing family. Fortunately, she spoke to the executives at HCF and shortly realised it's a very supportive and inclusive culture and she's never looked back. So here we are with Lorraine Thomas, the Chief Product and Innovation Officer from HCF. Lorraine reports directly into the CEO and looks after product, actuarial, innovation and the live company. So over 50 people in her department. So Lorraine and I are here tasting, blind tasting five champagnes today and we're both um, self-professed uh, champagne connoisseurs. So it'd be interesting to see if we get this tasting correct. So should we, should we start? Sounds like a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go number one. Number one. Okay. All right. Mm. I'm just going straight in there. <laughs> I just, I'm just trying to look like I know what I'm doing. So Lorraine, why do you love your job? Oh, that that's that for me is an easy one. I think the first thing I love about my job is I love the people I work with. And I think if we all reflect, we spend most of our time in the office, it's really important to love the people you work with. Second to that is I feel that through my work and through the role that I have, I can really make a difference. And lastly, it's all about um, delivery for me. So if you think about all the roles that I've ever held, it's about delivery, getting things done, completing initiatives, um, and that really drives me and every day is different. So easy for me to get up in the morning and, and want to hop skip into the office when we can make it into the office <laughs> or at the moment um, click on to the, the team's meeting and sort of get right into it. Awesome. So why did you take the job in the first place? What was the decision process that you went through? Well, as you would know, <laughs> you were contacting me on a regular basis, um, as all good recruitment companies do, to see whether I was in the right place to move on from my current role. And I think after, you know, gosh, I don't know how many calls saying, no, 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 I'm really happy. I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still delivering. I'm still excited about my current role. One day you called me and I kind of said to you, actually, Vic, now's a really good time. Let's talk about what's that next opportunity. And you pitched the um, HCF role to me. And at the time I was thinking, oh gosh, health insurance, I have not done health insurance. I wouldn't have any of the competencies that they're looking for, but we had a chat and um, I went for the first interview. And I have to be honest with you, that was such a, a great process. And I loved the people that were interviewing me and I was really sold on them. So, yeah. And, and did you at any point um, think about not going for the role or going through the process? Um, before the first interview, yeah, because I, I, I kind of looked at it, I think we all do, we look at the job description and I was looking at all the things I didn't have in terms of skills and competencies or all the experience I didn't have that kind of met the job description. But then I got to the point in my current role where I really needed to change and I really wanted to challenge myself and I thought, you know, there's no harm going for the interview. Let's go and have a conversation and let's just see where that takes you. Um, but I must admit, I think we all sometimes think we, we can't, you know, go for that next opportunity because we're not ticking all the boxes. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I didn't do that. And I'm glad you encouraged me to kind of go forward. And, and after the first interview, I really wanted the job. Yeah. 
I was really hungry for it. So yeah. you were absolutely the front runner for, for them, if I recall. So how about we taste the next one? So Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Let's Gosh, go for number, so two. number two. I'm really hoping this is the dorm. I feel like, well, oh, the, nice. the colour's quite nice. Yeah. Not that I know much about that, but sounds good. I don't think I can afford dom on a regular basis, as in more than once every 10 years. <laughs> mm. Oh, so nice. That's very nice, though. I We like this one. Surely Not that, that number one isn't Aldi's, very nice. I, this can't be the Audi special, because if it is, I'm racing down there. No. If that's an Audi special, then... Mm. I'm seriously wasting my money on other champagne. Oh, hands. that's so good. Right. Okay, better crack on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do you select your mentors? Oh, that's a really, that's a great question, actually. A um, few things. I think it's got to be personality and style because I'm very values driven. So right sort of values, right style, right fit. Fit's, I think, really important. And then also it's about, I think, what I'm trying to um, achieve from the relationship. Mm. So partnering with someone that can kind of help me, whether it's with um, a style or with uh, an issue or developing me in a different way. So again, it's that alignment. Um, and I think having the clarity to make sure that they want to help as well, because mm. I think sometimes we try to force people into mentor relationships mm. and, and that's also not necessarily going to get the right outcome. Mm. So they need to want to do it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And do you at that point say to them, can you be my mentor or is it more organic? No, for me, it's more organic. It starts mm. with a friendship and networking connection or, or some other sort of um, point in time situation. And then through that sort of dialogue, conversation, sometimes it comes up with, oh, you, you know, would you like to mentor me or can you be a mentor? Other times it's like, let's just continue the conversation. I'm a huge believer in conversations, talk probably a little too much at times, but I think that's how you get the best out of those networking mm -hmm. situations as opposed to formalising it sometimes, which then puts a lot of, um, I think, puts a lot of expectation. It's pressure, isn't it? And pressure. Yeah. And and I think, you know, the one thing I've learned is I've probably learned more out of the poor mentoring relationships mm. to understand now how the better ones work. And for me, it is the fit and it's the people. Mm. Um, it's that connection around, you know, things that we have in common. And how do you feel being a mentor to others? And how, how does that relationship work best for you? Um, I think it's around the clarity again around what we're or what that person wants to achieve out of that relationship. Mm. Um, so I do have, you know, quite a few people that will ask me to be a mentor. And my first question always is kind of what they want to achieve mm. to make sure that, yes, I'm going to be the right person. Because right person. sometimes they, they ask me because of my role, chief officer, mm. as opposed to perhaps aligning to what I can deliver to them in terms of skill alignment or um, experience. Yeah. And what percentage of people do you think are genuinely authentic when they come to you and ask you to be their mentor? Um, this is quite a pointy question, right? I'm yeah. really interested to know. <laughs> um, well, look, I, I like to think the best of everybody, but you, you are right. That <laughs> I like to think. Always start with everyone's got the right motivations Absolutely. and behaviours. But sometimes there, I think there is that component where people approach you to be a mentor because you're in a senior role and they think that if they can build a relationship with a senior leader, that might have an advantage to them. Um, and that's not always the way it works. So no. look, 80-20 rule. Let's, I always go 80-20 rule. I think 80% of the people who approach me have best interest and 20% perhaps they're more strategic. Yeah. Um, I'd like to feel that I've got a good sense of that yeah. though. And, and then it's about how you manage that appropriately to kind of say, I'm maybe not the right person. Yeah. yeah. Being honest. Awesome. Oh, that is what yeah. this is all about, right? Um, so in terms of your career, what would you say your biggest career regret has been? Oh, I, I know the answer to this, but then I also like to think that even when you make a, a mistake or a poor decision, you can take a positive out of it. Mm. So it is a regret, but it's also a positive. So I kind of like 
<laughs> I'm a kind of like glass yeah, half yeah. full girl. So um, although when the champagne's empty, the champagne's <laughs> empty. Um, so really it was when I was impatient in my last role and I really wanted that next career step. And I jumped out to a company and a lot of people took me to one side. So friends, mentors, leaders mm -hmm. and said, I don't think that company is the right one for you. The fit's not going to work for your style, for your value system. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a senior role. Um, yes, more money. Um, but they cautioned me, and I have to say, on day one of walking into the building, I knew I'd made the wrong choice. That early? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Wrong choice. Um, lots of other things occurred as always, you know, changes in structure on day one, which are always a bit um, <laughs> uncomfortable. It's very really structures in a year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think the other thing, I then spent, I think, about uh, six months there, and every day I, I, I dreaded going into the office. Oh, no. I, I really disliked walking in. And, and then I was very, very lucky that um, another opportunity came my way and I could actually exit and then go go to another opportunity. What I learned is don't be too hasty, do your due diligence, listen to people and mm. take on board why they're giving you that advice. Mm. Um, because yeah, I should have just been a bit more patient. Mm. Good answer. You deserve number three now. How many more questions do we have? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got, yeah, we've got a few. Oh, it smells interesting. Is it a bit funky? It's that silent pause as we take a goal. Oh, oh. Mm. if that's a dog, I'm going to cry because that is horrible. So, Lorraine, what do you do when you're in a work funk? When you don't hop, skip and jump out the door or onto teams? Yeah. Um, well, now, because we've just got a new puppy, now I take the puppy for a walk. Mm. And before that, I would just go on a walk myself. But mm. now I've got extra motivation, so... Um, the puppy and I, we go on a walk. We live near the Bay Run, which is really beautiful. So um, I'm lucky enough that I can jump out the door, go on a walk, clear my head. Um, I call it puppy training as well, although I don't think she's that into it. And, and just reset myself. I think reset is really important um, when something quite, doesn't quite go to plan. Mm. Um, try to clear my head and, and get myself focused again. How long does it take you to get out of your work funk? Well, it depends on how bad the work function is, oh, really? in all honesty. <laughs> um, but look, a half an hour, a good half an hour. Oh, That's just incredible. to kind of clear the head, think of something, put some music on. I'm a huge believer in music um, to also kind of kind of clear the head. Yeah, recenter. Yeah. Yeah. So, but before that, I would just jump out and go for a walk. But now the puppy motivates me too. Yeah, they do that, mm. don't they? So what what is your philosophy that you live by at work? Um, well, for anyone who knows me, I'm a huge believer in values. So um, integrity, um, authenticity, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of kind of like the, the fake. Mm. So probably a little too honest at times. But I, I feel like, you know, if, if you can treat others like you would like to be treated at mm. the end of the day, so that's really around demonstrating those values on a daily basis. Um, being honest, though, like so mm. to your point, you know, when things don't co go quite well, being really honest about it. Like I've had a bad start to the day. Yeah. That really helps frame Sweet. why things might not be going to plan. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I also I'm really results driven. So for me, it's it's being really clear on what we need to achieve and being really um, consistent in that as well. Mm. So I think if people understand what we're here to achieve as an organisation or as a team, it's so much easier to kind of have difficult conversations as well if you need to. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, and in terms of um, your mental resilience, um, when, when I interviewed you just a week ago, you spoke to me about some of the adversity through university mm. and some other things that yeah. you'd, you'd sort of been through. How have you built your mental resilience over the years? Um, well, look, uh, yeah, I think it's sort of, it does go back to my upbringing. And I think we like to think that, you know, as professionals in, you know, big careers that, you know, we've always been like this, but the reality is we're shaped from our, you know, background, we're shaped from our heritage. Um, so definitely my childhood has helped me be resilient because childhood, you know, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't easy either. Uni wasn't straightforward for different reasons. My mom had some, you know, health issues, which were really challenging for us as a family to work through. Um, 
we didn't have a lot growing up. So I'm really grateful that I can afford champagne now because, you know, that certainly wouldn't be something that my mm. family would have been doing on a regular basis. Um, so that's a good grounding, a good foundation. Um, that said, you know, there are still things that are, you know, happen to us personally and also professionally. And so what I always do is reflect back on that past and go, I'm very lucky. I'm incredibly lucky for the opportunities I've had. I've got a fantastic family. I've got two fantastic boys. We've got four crazy cats, now a crazy puppy. Um, I'm very grateful for what I have today and hopefully tomorrow and into the future. And that really you know, helps me with that resilience. Mm. And I try not to get too overwhelmed, but there are days where, yeah, I'm human. And of course there are things that happen that you know can upset me. But um, again, it's reflecting on where I've come from mm. and what I've achieved and what I hope to be able to achieve going forward as well. So how do you think the future of work will look? Gosh, I think, I think maybe COVID has given us a little bit of a snapshot because mm. I think, you know, technology is going to just change everything, mm. whether it's the way we work or the pace of change. Also consumer expectations because, again, I think technology really does challenge us on the way that consumers are expecting to interact with us. Mm. So I think technology is, you know, absolutely going to change the way we work. I think um, artificial intelligence and, and sort of how we use that and, and what that means in terms of some traditional roles and how we actually um, enhance our ability to kind of automate as well and do more predictive automation. So I think autom um, artificial intelligence. And then the other thing is just people. Mm -hmm. I think the future workforce has much greater expectations on us as employees, leaders, um, companies. I think they just have now different kind of um, expectations. And I think that's really going to challenge us on how we get the best talent. I don't think it's any more just salary. I don't think it's kind of like, you know, those traditional career plans. I actually think it's going to be, again, what the company stands for, your purpose, how you um, interact. Um, and I think it's also going to be that flexibility and COVID has really shown that people now, you know, flexibility, we used to always talk about it. And it used to be kind of like a ticker box saying, oh, we, we offer mm, flexible work. Absolutely. But I think COVID has really challenged us on what do we mean by flexible work? Absolutely. So, yeah, but who, uh, who knows? I mean, who would have thought like a year ago that we'd all be working from home and we'd all, you know, be facing into a pandemic and just managing that? So, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to predict too far out into the future. No. I think what I, uh, th there's a couple of um, silver linings from COVID and, and one of them for me is that it's the largest work from home experiment the world has ever seen and has yeah. genuinely propelled the flexibility movement forward mm. for years. The challenge that we have now, though, is that unfortunately what we are seeing is that there's a lot of companies that are resorting and reverting to back to where they were pre-COVID, and we can hear the dialogue. The dialogue's coming through. Mm. Well, they can work from home. When COVID is sort of over, um, they can sort of work from home again, um, and, and when they can do that is when they build up trust. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm hearing the same language, which is, which is worrying me. So we're sort of, we're now sort of almost reverting, mm -hmm. um, n not in all cases. I think, I think trust is really key and critical, but it's also how do you measure output? Because for me, it's all about the output at the end of the day. Now, whether you're doing that in the office, at home, um, in another location, it's around, are you delivering the output? And this is the output to the expectations of the company or, you know, the leader. And, and then I think fundamentally, it's also challenging ourselves to say that traditionally we've always worked sort of nine to five or within those sort of parameters. Maybe for some people working late into the evening gets the best out of them as for some maybe working from five in the morning and having sort of, you know, different work hours and just accepting that that's, um, also totally appropriate and, and we can still deliver what we need to deliver. I think the thing for me, is, which I don't think we've solved yet, is, is how do you collaborate effectively when everyone's in different places as well? Mm. Um, so an example of that is if you're holding a workshop, can you be effective where you've got 80% in person and you've got a few people on the phone or on a video conference? 
do we forget the people on the video conference as an example? So because everyone's in person. So for me, it's the collaboration and how does that mm. um, play out in this new world and mm. how is it effective for all? Because I must admit, it already, you know, there's been those scenarios where, you know, we've been workshopping. Those in person are just having a chat and those on the phone are just forgotten. And I think that's that's mm. the kind of what we need to solve for. How do we do that? It's a good point. So let's go for number four. <laughs> And we might need to just start again because I've forgotten what number one was like now. Yes, I think we need to, definitely. So, hmm, interesting. Hmm. I think I'm not going to give up my day job, by oh, the way. I'm not going to give up mine. I'm terrible. That is quite nice, though. I thought I was going to be amazing at this, but this <laughs> is actually really hard. <laughs> Maybe I should hmm. drink more champagne. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to help, but... <laughs> Well, you can put it to probably the won't help at the moment for sure. So, um, in terms of when you hire um, for someone mm. new, what are the attributes that you look for? So again, I, I it's interesting because someone once challenged me on this, but I'll still hold my ground. I have to say is I am now more often than not looking for the right behaviours and fit over typical competency. Um, obviously, it's skills and the ability to do the job is really important, but at the end of the day, it's the behaviour and it's the team fit that actually makes a difference. And if we think about how we work now, we are delivering on initiatives that are cross-functional, so I need to make sure people can collaborate. They're great communicators. Um, they understand sort of, you know, deadlines and hitting deadlines as well. So, you know, I think all of that comes out in behaviour mm -hmm. and team fit. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're, you know, the most um, technically qualified is probably something that I'm likely to consider as where can we help them with their development or where can we support them with training or mentoring and fill the gap that way because it's much easier to, to train the skill component of the roles that I look for versus the correct the behaviour. Yeah. I mean, so, do people really change fundamentally? I think in my experience now, having had a lot of people come and go, generally no and I I'll often say that you only need one person to change the whole dynamics of a team and really impact the culture and as a result of that it impacts the delivery it impacts so many things and it makes again back to my first time of why do I love my job because mm. I love the people I love coming mm. to work I like everyone to enjoy coming in every day as much as they can and, and I feel like behavior is critical to that mm. so behavior um I'm still a little bit old school in ways that I go a little bit in my gut and I know anyone that kind of, you know, is committed to those psychometric tests and all the other things, very valid, but sometimes the, the gut feel as well um, is really important. So the EQ more so necessarily than the IQ, mm. but I mean, oh gosh, I think we've all had situations where we've had great, fantastic highs and then we've also unfortunately had, you know, the different situation occur. If you have made a mistake or it's not working, deal with it quickly. Yes. Yeah, well, they So don't right. procrastinate in that decision. Have the open, honest conversation and deal with that situation efficiently and effectively. So what do they say? Hire slow and fire fast. Or have the conversation on what's expected yeah. even because sometimes it could just be around um, lack of role clarity or lack of understanding around what the key KPIs are. Absolutely. And I think you come back to communication is critical and being honest. And, and direct, um, I, I think yeah, for, clear. exactly right. Yeah. I think I would have hired oh, thousands, tens of thousands of people in my career mm. um, through my business, but of, of course on site for clients. Mm. And even when I hire for my business, I get it wrong. And, and people laugh at that. They're like, how can you get it wrong? Isn't that what you do for a job? And it's like, well, it is, but people are incredibly complex and they... You know, you can do all of the testing and you can have, uh, you know, eight different interviews over hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, some people who are the best interviews, interviewers can get the job, the best job sometimes. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, I think it's hard on both sides as well because if I put myself in their shoes, mm -hmm. it must be terrible to be in a role in an organisation where it's not working. Mm. So I always kind of feel like, again, if, if going back to my philosophy of how I want, I want to be treated, like if, if that was me, I'd want someone to be honest with me that it's not working out. So again, it's kind of playing it back that way. And I, and I feel like everyone then 
they see that. So your teams see what's going on. Mm-hmm. I think we're not, you know, living in a bubble where they don't know what's occurring. No. And so it's really important to demonstrate as a leader that, yes, we do have to have those difficult conversations at the appropriate time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just important about managing people, I think, full stop. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we've got one other question before we go into our fifth champagne. Um, what advice will you uh, do you give professionals that are maybe struggling in finding clarity for their career path? Um, I think the first thing is to kind of try to take a step back. So remove yourself from the what I consider to sometimes be that cycle of despair where everything's getting too much, you just don't know how to solve the situation. Take the step back, write a list, what's working, what's not working. Um, tap into your network. So whether it's a mentor or just an informal network, because that's what I didn't do. So when I went back to like my what I consider to be my career mistake, I didn't ask anyone advice. I certainly didn't listen to anyone when I had said I'm moving to this role and they were saying, oh, are you sure about that? Mm. I didn't listen. I thought, you know, I you know, found the solution and it was going to be a fantastic opportunity. And on reflection, yeah, I, 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 should, have, I should have paused. Mm. I should have really sought feedback and then I should have also validated the choice as well that I was making. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, again, Everyone believes that they know themselves the best, but that external kind of checkpoint is really important, that validation. Mm. Um, and even if you still go ahead and, you know, you continue with the decision that you've made, mm. um, fantastic. But I think, yeah, I, I, it's really important to um, look at things from different perspectives and try to think about are there different solutions as well to getting out of that career mm. hole or mm. that kind of career kind of, you know, despair, because sometimes it's a sideways move. It's not necessarily an exit. Sometimes Mm. it's actually trying a secondment somewhere and trying something different to evaluate perhaps, you know, what you do like, what you don't like, and how you can actually progress further. Absolutely. So let's go for our final champagne, because then we've got a a final question and we can can start working out which ones we think is which. Yeah. Hmm. I think I know this one drink enough of this <laughs> <laughs> you could be right it's very dry all right could be totally wrong probably am wrong I'm a bit nervous about this yeah yeah look this will be interesting put it this way if the one I like I is I'm gonna go opposite you. the Aldi special my husband's going to challenge my champagne purchases from here on in mm. all right so he's got the answers or is there another question first? There's one more question. Oh, okay. This is a fun question. And finally, when COVID restrictions ease, what will be the first country you visit and why? Oh, gosh. Um, the natural answer to this would be the UK because I haven't been able to see my parents for a while. And your mum might watch this. so And she may. <laughs> you or might. my dad, more importantly. <laughs> and they haven't been able to see the boys... Um, for quite a while but to be honest with you I'm not sure I want to put myself on a plane and go to the UK there's not a lot of sun so I was thinking maybe it could be one of our favorite destinations where we've actually taken my parents and the boys have a lot like a huge amount of fun there and that would be Abu Dhabi um and we'd all meet in Abu Dhabi we would do all the fun stuff the kids love and then we do all the stuff that we love and we just have a great family reunion and it would be warm more importantly, because I'm not sure I'm committed after these many years out of the UK of jumping on a plane to the UK for the grey rain and the weather and the climate. No. I, I'm offending all of my UK friends I, and family. I was just going to say, you're going to be in so much trouble. But look, I think it's a, a, a midway point yeah. is, is happy for everyone. Yeah, it's not too far for them to travel. It's not too far for us. It's neutral. Um, yeah. And it's fantastic. It's a great um, experience if you haven't been. Awesome. Thank you, Lorraine. That was that was a lot of fun. Now thank you. To... Thank you for the invitation and um, thank you for the array of champagne that's now really confused me. I know. I think we've actually got a couple of similar, haven't we? You got the results? You got the results? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no, we got it. No, we got it. We got it. We got oh, the dog. Oh, like, oh, my goodness. I was about to, like, I stress slightly. So, 
Audi specials. So the first one was Prosecco. Oh. So you got the Dom correctly. Thank goodness. goodness. The middle oh. one was actually the Audi. Oh. Blanc de Blanc was the the fourth one, and the fifth one was Verve, which was a no brainer with Verve. We were both quite keen on that. So what this does tell me is we do know our champagnes as such. We know our French champagnes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the Audi, we both got, oh no, the Audi, no. we got different, but the Blanc de Blanc. So yeah. let's call it a tie. Cheers with the Dom Perignon. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> Lovely to catch up. Lovely to catch up.